continue our Luke study, I invite you to open your Bibles to Luke 24. We're going to be looking at verses 13 to 35 today. The title of our talk today is When Jesus Breaks Bread. And uh, if you have a Bible, I think it would be great if you would open it so you could follow along. Also, your Bible app, you'll find all of the the notes uh, and the Bible verses in there as well. So today, we come to a most unusual post-resurrection story. We hear that there are two followers of Jesus. Now, only one of them is named Cleopas. And then there's another unnamed follower. The two of these people were walking on the road to Emmaus on resurrection day, later on that day. And then a third person starts walking with them. Now, (laughs) Luke uh, doesn't know anything about the spoiler alert thing, all right? So he just tells us what's happening here, okay? But the people who are walking, they don't know that the third walker is Jesus. They don't recognize him. In fact, we're told that they were kept from recognizing Jesus. Reading verses 15 and 16 from Luke 24, as they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. And that leads us to our first point today, and that is that Jesus is often with us even when we don't recognize him. Now, I look back at this uh, story And I wonder, you know, how it's possible that they wouldn't know who Jesus was. There's only two possibilities. Luke doesn't tell us exactly how this happens, but, you know, you just use your imagination here a little bit. Either Jesus had the power to just cloud their mind enough not to recognize who he was, right? That could be one option. The other option is is that he could just completely disguise himself. He could take on any kind of form that he wanted to, and they wouldn't know that that was him. I don't know which one is more powerful, but, you know, God is powerful. God can do whatever it is that he wants. And so my question for us is if that's possible for Jesus on resurrection day, isn't it possible that he could also be with us sometimes and we not know it? See, I think there's going to come a time when we are in heaven, after this life is all over, when we will discover many times when Jesus was, in fact, with us, and we didn't even know it. In fact, Scripture tells us straight out that every time that we feed the hungry, that we clothe the naked, that we visit those in prison, that we are actually doing these things to and for Jesus. We literally become the hands and feet of Jesus, and we minister to Jesus when we minister to those who are hungry and those who need clothing and to those who are in prison. And by the way, if you want to understand that, just turn over to Matthew 25. It's all laid out right there. There's also times that Jesus is with us when we might not know it. Again, the Bible tells us that one of Jesus' names, I don't know, again, this isn't a Christmas lesson, but you remember this every year from Christmas, that one of Jesus' names is what? Emmanuel. And what does Emmanuel mean? God with us. And we read Matthew one twenty three from the Christmas story. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Now, the Bible couldn't be more clear, right? I'm going to tell you what the name is. I'm going to tell you what the name means so that you understand Jesus is with us all the time. In fact, Jesus himself promised us in Matthew 18 that if two or three or more gather in his name. What does it say? Take a look at Matthew 18, 20. For where two or three are gathered in in my name, what does it say? There am I among them. So if we're gathered in Jesus' name this morning, and I pray that we are, what does that mean? That Jesus is here with us. You may not know it. You may not recognize him, but it's true. Now, this is one of those cases where there is fact And then there is faith, fact and faith. See, I can point out all the different places in Scripture where God says that he is with us and he will never forsake us. That's repeated over and over again, all throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament. I can show you where Jesus himself says the same thing. And we can even agree that we believe it, right? We can believe it. 
You see this stool? I'm going to put this stool down here and move this over. Now, we have this stool. It looks pretty sturdy, right? It looks pretty steady. If I put this stool down here, I can say, I think, I believe that that stool will hold me. Right? I believe it. I have faith in it, right? Well, maybe, maybe not. Is my faith a head knowledge or is it a heart knowledge? You know what I mean? Sometimes we believe things in our head, but it somehow it never travels the inches necessary to go to the heart. And that's true about a lot of things that we see in the Bible. That in the Bible, we see things that Jesus says, I'm with you always, and we say, yeah, I get that, I understand that, but do we really believe it? So how do you really believe it? Well, you put your faith in it. How do I put my faith in the stool? What should I do if I really want to say, I believe this stool will hold me up? i got to sit on it. You're right. And voila, no matter how much I ate this week, it still held me up. Now, you see, that is where the faith of heart can be more powerful than the faith of head. And that's where we have to have some heart knowledge. Believing that Jesus is always with me is the same thing. In fact, that leads us to our second point this morning, and that is that we can know all the facts but still not know the faith. We can know all the facts, but not necessarily know all the faith. So these three, the two disciples and Jesus, but they can't recognize him. They're having this conversation in verse 18. Um, you know, Jesus asks, well, what, what's going on? And, and they say to him, well, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? Like, they just can't believe that somebody would be walking on the road from Jerusalem to Emmaus and not know what's been going on. Because what? They've had front center seats to this whole experience, right? So these two walkers to Emmaus, they have all the facts. They told the story, interestingly enough, to Jesus, who was the center of it, but they didn't know that. They tell the whole story about everything that happened But it didn't mean that they necessarily believed it. Now, what do I mean when I say they didn't necessarily believe it? What had happened that morning? The the women had come back and said, hey, we saw the tomb and it was empty. And there were angels there. And they said that he's not here among the dead. Among the dead, he has risen. And then we hear the story about uh, Peter who goes and runs and finds it's the same thing, right? I mean, so we have all these stories going on, but they haven't yet sat in the stool. They haven't yet experienced the risen Christ. So they know the facts, and they're repeating the facts to this third traveler that's going along with them, but it doesn't mean that they believe it. Now, here's a fascinating thing. So this third traveler, who you all know because you're in on it, to be Jesus, He, in verse 27, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. Now, let's break this down a little bit. Whenever you see in the New Testament somebody say Moses and all the prophets, that's code. Do you know what that's code for? That's code for the Old Testament. You say, how do you get that? Well, Moses would be the first five books of the Old Testament. And then all the prophets would be all the prophetical books that's in the Old Testament. So when you read this, you should translate in your mind the Old Testament. Moses, first five books, prophets, and prophetical books. And here is a fascinating thing for us today who have all these Bibles and all this technology. It wasn't at all unusual in that first century for someone who was a rabbi to actually have this entire thing memorized. One of the ways you could tell it was a rabbi would be that they could just quote any scripture right off the top of their head because they had it memorized. But Jesus, he takes it a step further. He not only knows it, but he knows what it means. Right? There's a difference between knowing something and knowing what it means. And so he could explain what it meant 
to the others. He could teach them. And that's what's happening on this road to Emmaus. They're having this amazing Jesus experience, this Jesus teaching experience, and they have no idea yet, but they're beginning, I think, to suspect. See, this teaching ability that Jesus had, that was a rare gift. And I am sure that would be something that would be incredible to hear. And here's an interesting thing. What is it that, that he says in verse 27 about all the scriptures? He tells him what all was said in the scriptures, what? The last two words, concerning himself. Isn't that interesting? Concerning himself. You see, Jesus is basically saying, hey, folks, the entire Old Testament points to me. Everything that's been happening in the Moses, book of Moses, books of Moses and the prophets is all pointing to now. And that leads us to another important truth for today, and that is it's not just enough to read the Bible. We all have to have the Holy Spirit explain it to us. When Paul is writing to the church at Ephesus in Ephesians 1.18, he says this. This is part of his prayer. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ the glorious Father may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. What's Paul praying for here? Paul is praying for these believers in the church at Ephesus that God the Father would give them God the Holy Spirit. I know that twists us up, right, when we're thinking about the Trinity. But he's praying that God the Father would give them God the Holy Spirit for two reasons for wisdom, and for revelation. Notice there are two separate things here. There's wisdom to know the facts, but revelation to believe how it applies to us. You see, that's where the faith comes in. So now let's just suppose that Jesus has been close to you this week, but you haven't recognized him yet. Is there a way, is there something that you can do that will lead your eyes to be open to his presence in your life? And I think the answer is yes. In fact, we've already participated in it today. Number three, we see this, that Jesus is most clearly revealed to us when we break bread. Jesus is most clearly revealed to us when we break bread. Reading from verses 30 and 31. So, so just before we get to that, they basically they get to the place where they're going, and the Jesus acts like he's going to keep on going, and they beg him to stay, right? And so he's, he's sitting down at the table with them, and it says, when he was at the table with them, verse 30, when he was at the table with them, he took bread, gave thanks, broke it, and began to give it to them. And then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. Do you see that? <laughs> I, I can't help but think how many times over the three years that they had broke bread together. And how many times every time that Jesus broke the bread with them that he prayed a prayer of thanks and he passed it. I mean, there's just so many coincidences here begin to add up. And finally it says, though, that their eyes were open, As if they didn't even have control over whether or not they could really recognize Jesus or not. Unless Jesus or the Holy Spirit or God the Father opened their eyes so that they might see. And this was, what, a communion time, right? They were breaking bread together. It was something that they did. It was something where they recognized Jesus in this breaking of bread. Now, we have to be very careful about holding out the communion time as a magical enchantment to conjure up Jesus, all right? I don't want to give you that idea at all. By the way, did you know from the Middle Ages that this is where the original meaning of hocus pocus comes from? Anybody know that? You ever hear when somebody's doing magic, they say hocus pocus? Did you know that that actually comes from the church? You say, oh, how does it come from the church? Well, when the priest in the Middle Ages would come to the communion time, they were trained to say the Latin words hocus corpus meum. Hocus corpus meum. Now, my Latin isn't all that great, but hoc s means my, uh, this is, hoc s, this is corpus, body, meum, my. This is my body. And so every time that somebody, 
you know, held up the, the wafer, they would say hocus corpus meum. And many people believed that at that point, that was where Jesus literally became the bread. Okay, do you understand what I'm saying? And there was a magical thing that kind of happened there, that Jesus incorporated himself in the bread. And so hocus pocus became magic for being able to change one thing to another. Oh, you learned something you didn't know maybe. So I'm not saying that today. I'm not saying that when we go to the communion table, there's this magical thing that happened. That's not what I'm saying. I am saying, though, that it is true that these Emmaus Christ followers' eyes were opened at that exact moment, right? You see it there in Scripture. And since it appears from the earlier Scripture that they were kept from recognizing Jesus, right? In other words, it's like a power outside of themselves that kept them from recognizing Jesus at the beginning, that something or someone beyond them opened their eyes when at that moment when they broke bread. Okay, you following what I'm saying there? And certainly the early Christians practiced the sharing of the communion elements as often as they met together, along with other things, prayer and the word. In fact, we, we read in Acts 2.42, which gives us the clearest picture of what the early church practiced, Acts 2.42, and they, this would be the early Christians, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, that's one, apostles' teaching, and the fellowship, read that as greeting time, <laughs> to the breaking of bread, what is that? That's communion time. And to the prayers, what's that? That's our congregation. Does that look familiar, by the way? What is it that we do Every single week when we come here to Church Requel, right? Do we dedicate ourselves to the teaching from the Word of God? Do we dedicate ourselves to the fellowship time? Do we dedicate ourselves to the breaking of bread? Do we dedicate ourselves to prayer time? Do you see that? All four of those examples are places where Jesus can become very real, very clear to us. The same devotion works for us today. And that is why, by the way, we include here at Church Requel communion as part of our worship every week. I want you to know that that's not my background. That's not my history. That never happened in my life until Church Requel started. Like most of you, coming from a Protestant background, we did communion every so often, but not necessarily every week. I know some of you did it every week, but... In my experience, we did it maybe once a quarter or so, and that was our experience. The Bible is actually not real specific about how often we should have communion, so we can't criticize anybody else for not doing it like we do, nor can they criticize us for doing it as often as we do. But I see here an example of why wouldn't we want to. What, when we started Church Requel, just kind of giving you, by the way, we're coming up on 10 years in October. We haven't been here that long, five years here, but it was uh, October when Church Requel first met in the living room of Pastor Mark and Mary Kay's house. Some of you remember, don't you? Right? You were there, and you can't believe you're 10 years older now, can you? <laughs> All right, so, but when we were just a small gathering, the first time I think we got together, there were maybe 10 of us. And it just seemed like the most natural thing in the world for us to break bread together, to take communion. And so we got in the habit, we got in the practice of doing that every Sunday when we met together. Rachel remembers that. She was part of that early crowd too. And so we did all that together. And then when we actually met publicly, it just seemed weird that we would stop that practice. So that's kind of how this whole thing got started. Now, I don't know about you, but to me... Whenever I go to another church, as I occasionally do, especially when we're on vacation, never take a vacation from God, right? Uh, when you go to another church and they're not having communion, I feel like I'm missing something. You know, this is just ingrained in me. All right, one more important takeaway for today. Number four, when we encounter Jesus, we should share the experience. When we encounter Jesus, we should share the the experience. Now, I don't mean this in just an evangelistic way. Those of you like me who come from an evangelistic you know, background, the preacher just can't say, go tell others enough, right? I mean, that's kind of the way that it's ingrained in us. But that's not what I'm talking about here. 
but I'm talking about sharing the experience. I'm talking about we share the experience with one another, with one another. Let's take a look at verse 32 and 33 to get a sense of what I mean. So now these two walkers to Emmaus, they're, they're, at, this, they're at this table, and they, were, they just had Jesus break bread for them, and then what happened? He disappeared. That would kind of shock you, wouldn't it? You know? And so they asked each other, verse 32, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? And they got up, and here's the key, they returned at once to Jerusalem. Do you catch that? Returned at once. Why returned at once to Jerusalem? Who was in Jerusalem? All the other disciples. They didn't want to wait around. They didn't say to themselves, well, we can wait till next Sunday. <laughs> That's what Sundays are for. We'll just go back to the next church service. No, they returned at once. There was an urgency to it. Why? Because the others had to know what happened to them. Do you know that the Bible is very clear that this is what we should do too with one another? We read in 1 Thessalonians 5, 11, Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up just as, in fact, you are doing. This is such an important part of our Christian journey, and sadly, too many of us are missing out. Did you know that there are 94 verses in the New Testament with one another in them? Love one another, accept one another, forgive one another, bear with one another, greet one another, all right? So certainly, Christianity is a one another kind of faith. Did you know that? There is no such thing as a lone ranger Christian. There's no one who can just stay by themselves and say, well, I'm a Christ follower. I don't need to go to church to be a Christian. No. The Bible is very clear that we need you and you need us. We need one another. And there should be relationships with one another, with each one of us. So when, in those occasions, when we experience Jesus in our life, when he's revealed to us, the question is this, are you close enough to people that you can at once be able to tell others about it, that you can share that experience? I'll tell you, there are two really good reasons why you should share that experience with one another. Reason number one, it's good for other people. Not just good for you, it's good for other people. You have a responsibility when you've had a Christ experience that's worth talking about, you have a responsibility to build others up with your encouragement. And your Jesus sighting could be just the encouragement, could be just a positive, encouraging story to share with someone else. Who knows? Maybe, just maybe, the person that you're telling, and you don't even know this, maybe they are struggling with their own faith and that God is counting on you in that moment to be the one to provide them encouragement. And in those cases, you literally become Jesus to them. Stop and think about it. Maybe you've experienced Jesus in your life, not just for you, but so that you can share it with somebody else. Maybe there's somebody else who really needs to hear from you. They're at that point where your sharing with them could make the difference. So it's good for others. And then secondly, the reason we should do it is because it's really good for us too. You see, you, <laughs> you need the affirmation of your own experience with Jesus. Do you know what I'm talking about? Every time that you tell the story, the story becomes a little bit more real to you, does it not? And when you don't tell the story... The longer it goes where you don't share it with somebody, you begin to have doubts among yourself. Did I really experience that? Did I really see that? Did I really hear that? Doubt can settle in when you keep good news to yourself. So get in the habit of sharing with other people. And then also get in the habit of listening to other people when they have their own good news to share with you. 
And I'm really guilty of this. I know this is true of me. You know, I'm, a, I'm got my blinders on. I'm focused. I know what I got to be doing. And there's somebody who wants to tell me something, and, and I can be blind to it. I know. I, 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 I've been working on this in my life for the last 40 years. <laughs> I'm getting, you should have seen me 40 years ago. <laughs> but we need to not be in such a rush. We need to be able and willing to sit down with somebody when somebody wants to tell us their Jesus experience because it's not only good for them, it's good for us as well. What about you this week? Are you ready and willing to tell of your own Jesus experience and to hear others as well?